Uh, for those of you who were here last week, Pastor Ashley Good uh, has contacted me a couple of times, continuing to rave about the life of the church here and our team and, and just the atmosphere of the service uh, and the sense of the anointing of God. And uh, some of his team members have been chatting. And uh, so who knows, we might have a couple of them pop in just to see what's going on. Uh, it really is exciting. To, and you know, sometimes we don't realize what God has given us nor how much God has given us as a people of, in this house. Before I come to preach this morning, I do want to bring something political to your attention. Um, the government is looking at changing some of our religious freedoms, and the bill currently they're looking at um, wants to take away the right for Christian schools to employ Christians. Uh, they want to force Christian schools to uh, open up employment to people who aren't Christian, and don't teach from a Christian perspective. Uh, and that, that to me is concerning. It's concerning that the world is trying to steal away from the house of God and the family of God and the church and the family, because the school is part of the church family. Um, and so I would really encourage you to write a letter to Keith Pitt, our local member. There are about 50 sheets uh, with the details of just a sample letter. Don't do it verbatim, write with your own words, but it gives you the basic context. Uh, and it's, it's out in the foyer. If you want to just take a photocopy, a photograph of it with your phone, that's fine as well. And, and please, I would encourage you this week, don't, don't put it off, maybe even this afternoon, write a letter, send an email to our local member, Keith Pitt. I, I believe he's actually in favour of you know, not changing it. He's against that. But the more support he gets in that from the community, the stronger the argument is that he can bring to, to, to not rob the church and the school of the ability. Because I can tell you right now, if, if it gets done for schools, they will then start making churches uh, open up employment in the life of the church. They say it, oh, we won't make ministers, churches do that. Yes, you will. We know they say they won't, but they do. And it will come further along the track. So uh, please, I would encourage you, go uh, and pick up that in the foyer, take a photograph, and please write a letter, sign it, put your details on it. Uh, I, look, I, I put in a submission to this report, clearly opposing it, um, and I would encourage you, give Keith Pitt support. Whether you like him or not politically, he needs support on this issue so that we can protect the freedoms that we have as the church and as the Christian schools as well to help partner with us to raise children in the ways of God. So uh, that, that's the end of that. And uh, I want to come to the word of God today. Uh, I, want to, I want to look at Colossians chapter 2. Uh, and I'm going to do what they call an exegesis, which is looking at the text and reading what it's saying and developing that a little bit. Some, some people, uh, what they do is a thing called eisegesis. In other words, they go with an opinion and try and force that opinion into the text. And, and exegesis is actually, what does the text say? Reading it in its context, culture, genre, and understanding what it's saying. So here's what I want to talk about is, is but Jesus. And if you've got uh, a, a, a Bible you want to read through, sometimes you'll find that there are subtitles in this. And, and the subtitles are the core aspect of what I'm preaching about, but Jesus. So it says this in Colossians chapter 2, Paul writing, I want you to know, before, before I go, start, I, there are people here today, and y when you leave, you may or may not be Christ Christian, or you might even be, but when you leave, the devil's going to try and tell you it was an accident that you were here today, in, that, in one sense. And, and can I tell you, it's not an accident you're here today to hear this message. You may have come to see a water baptismal service, but it's intentional in God's plan. Just like communion, the first communion was, it was intentional. So you are not here by accident today to hear and see what God is doing. Anyway, let's keep going. Uh, Colossians 2, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery, the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now I say this, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. 
For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. This is an interesting passage, and it challenges us with something that comes from the very foundational root of our separation from God. See, there are basic principles of the world. Proverbs is full of them. They're basic principles. It's like, you know, one one says, rebuke a fool lest he think himself wise. Don't rebuke a fool lest you look stupid. Both those are true. They just are basic principles in a certain circumstance. Do it. In another circumstance, don't. There are basic principles, basic wisdoms in life, but they are not always what God is saying or doing. They're not necessarily evil and they're not necessarily good. Some are, some are very good, some are very evil. The questions we face as believers is not, is it good or is it bad? The primary question is, is it God or is it not? See, 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 it can be good, but it may not be God. And we've got to be careful because people do good and it may clearly never be God. Matthew 7, 21 says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And you know what? That, that, hang on, I'm, I'm doing God's will. I'm, I'm doing the work of God. Well, that's scary because Matthew 7, 22 says this. People will say to Jesus or, or to, to God, in that day they will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This, this is a scary passage. This is a scary passage because people are prophesying in Jesus' name. They're, they're praying and people are being healed in Jesus' name. Miracles are happening. Demons are being cast out in Jesus' name. But he's saying, that's not what I told you to do. You didn't do what I told you. You've taken the power I've given you and done what you felt like. See, the way to learn to do what he says is to know him, to walk in a relationship that pleases him, have a ear that hears what the Lord is saying. Constantly in Revelation, it says, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear. And so it's not about doing something good. It's about doing what God says. And that's a scary passage. You know, in Mark 9, it is similar but different vein. In Mark 9, 8, 38 to 41, it says this. Now, Jesus is strolling along and, and the disciples see something going on. And John says to him, teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name and we forbade them because he does not follow us. And Jesus said, don't forbid him. No one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. He who is not against us is on our side. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, assuredly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Now, the first thing I notice about this passage is it wasn't Peter sticking his foot in his mouth, it was John. Isn't that wonderful? That, that implies to me that all the disciples stuck their foot in their mouth. We just hear mostly about Peter and we give Peter a hard time. Similarly, all the apostles doubted the resurrection, but we blame Thomas for being a doubter. Come on, but they didn't believe the women. That told, you know, so, so let's not try and pick a poor disciple and lump him in it because we are they. You know, we're part of this. And, and John gets confronted by Jesus. The disciples have reasoned that unless the others are with them, 
they should not be using the name of Jesus. This seems to oppose the other text. The answer is it doesn't oppose it. It's just people heard and obeyed and people just did what they felt like. Good, but not God. See, what happens is, is for them, for the disciples and John especially there, it's the basic principle of the world they lived in that if you're not with me, you're against me. And Jesus turns that around because that is not always true. That's not always the same. Church needs to grab a hold of this on a broad spectrum. Just because someone goes to a different church doesn't mean they're against us. We don't like the Catholics. That's your problem, not God's. He loves them. See, see, here's the thing. We, we, we want to make these boundaries, these name tags, division instead of diversity. Because God reaches different people differently through different groups. And they're not against us. And Jesus is challenging us even in this passage for the church to realize that people don't always have to believe the same way we believe to be right with God. I mean, the disciples didn't get it right all the time. They messed up. We look after Pentecost. There's a whole lot of races, racial issues there. Peter going to Cornelius, so a Jew going to a Gentile, a Roman. I mean, one of, the, one of the people who've conquered their nation. And Cornelius is, you know, it's like, no, you shouldn't have gone there, Peter. In fact, he gets called away to a meeting with the leadership of the church in Jerusalem. Why did you do that? And he had to explain that God told him. See, it's not, was it right or was it wrong? It's what did God say? Now, everything God says will be right, but the question is always, Peter says, well, God told me and he showed me. In fact, this is what happened. And they go, ah, oh, well, maybe God does love sinners who aren't Jews too. Can I say thank you, Jesus? <laughs> I mean, not against the Jews, but boy, oh boy, we are all in need of a savior. And so John's, comment brings us to this thought Jesus reply to that tells us not everyone is or isn't a Christian based on the structure now look many churches claiming to be Christian actually fulfill the core conditions of being Christian and the primary separation point for a couple that I would say who claim to be Christian but are not and there's a very simple doctrinal truth about this, it is those who, those who don't claim or don't accept that Jesus is God, eternal, part of the Godhead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See, for some, they believe Jesus had a beginning. He was created somehow, whether through the birth, or, you know, God was created through a birth, or whether God uh, was created by God, which is what John 1, some people interpret, that God created God. And that was a lesser God, and that Jesus is a lesser God. And, and so those would not be considered biblically Christian. But most other churches who believe in God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in that man is a sinner by nature, and that Jesus came and died on a cross for us, raised again the third day, so that we can be forgiven of sin, and by faith in Jesus, a man who's been sinful, be forgiven and made right with God, that's pretty much all it has to be. God is loving and just, Man is a sinner by nature. Jesus died for us, and by faith in Jesus, a sinful man is made right with God. Simple as that. Okay, so we get this. The trouble is people who change that doctrine, they do it because of the basic principles of the world. They try and comprehend God with our comprehensibility. Now, now, just a pause. How do you comprehend someone who's never had a beginning? Just pause a moment. How do you comprehend someone who's never had a beginning? Because everything we know in the natural had a beginning. You had a beginning. It was called conception. Your parents had a beginning. It was called conception. Their parents and their parents and their parents and their parents. And biblically back to Adam, God created him. So where did God start? And to comprehend that is beyond our capacity. It's beyond the basic principles of the world. See, the basic principles of the world will never comprehend the things of eternity. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness in him, nor can he know them, but they, because they are spiritually discerned. 
See, natural reasoning sounds reasonable. Let me say that. Natural reasoning sounds reasonable. Well, that sounds reasonable, but it's wrong. If that's the only thing we function in, natural reasoning, trying to comprehend spiritual things with natural reasoning will never get there. Adam and Eve actually reasoned naturally that it was okay to sin. They did. We, we may or may not like it, but it's a reality. Let me read Genesis 3, verse 4. Then the serpent said to woman, you will not surely die, for God knows. So first he questions God, for God knows in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, the devil told a lie, but, but, but he told it in the form of a truth. After they ate, Adam and Eve knew they'd done evil. Before that, they had no comprehension of evil. Evil did not exist for them. But the moment they ate, they knew good and evil, and they knew they'd done evil. But they used natural reason. Listen to this. It goes on. So when the woman saw the tree was, listen, good for food. I think Dr. Berg tells you the tomatoes are from the deadly nightshade family. They're trying to kill you. All plants are trying to kill you, so eat beef. I mean, <laughs> they're deadly. See, plants are trying to protect themselves. They're actually, they're actually farming us until we die and fertilize them. It was good for food. Good reasoning. That looks good. That big plate of juicy, crisp grapes tasting sweet is good for you. Whatever they were. It wasn't an apple either. We don't know. It was pleasant to the eyes. Not only did it look, was, not only was it good for food, it looked good. It would have made the market at Big W. I mean, Woolies or Coles. Every farmer knows that you, if you want food, that if it's not the right condition, they won't take it and you've got to take it to a market because they want food that looks good. doesn't matter if it tastes good or not. You buy that nice shiny apple and it's all bruised on the inside and dead because it's been cold storage for a year and gas to be ready for you. But this was good. It was straight off the tree, fresh, ripe, good for food. It looked good. And if you ate it, it would make you wise. Tell me, is there anything wrong with any of those three comments? I mean, you jump online at times and I occasionally get this health food. If you eat this, your memory will be better. <laughs> Who, who's seen those ones? You know, eat this, your, your blood pressure will go down. If you drink this, you, you know, it's just too hard to comprehend half of it. And I don't know who's telling the truth half the time. Just eat a base, base, balanced basic diet, come on, and try and make it as organic as you can, if possible. Please, I'm not selling any of that. Just buy what you can. Okay. And so because she had reasoned it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and it would make her wise, her and Adam said, yeah, beauty, let's have a go. They reasoned because of their natural ability that it was okay to eat the fruit that God had said don't. And so their human reasoning, the basic principles of the world for them said it was okay to disobey God. That's what our world's doing today. It's giving a whole lot of basic human reasoning that says it's okay to disobey God in so many realms. It's okay for children to demand their rights from their parents when the Bible says, honor your mother and father. Children, obey your parents. Parents, don't cause your children to be angry so it puts responsibilities first. After responsibilities come rights. Not rights first. Rights sound reasonable. You, do, you need your rights. No, you need to fulfill your responsibilities. Then your rights will flow. See, God does it differently. Human reasoning will not work. So it's not human reasoning or the, the philosophy of the world, but it's Christ. Listen, for us, it's not human reasoning. It's not philosophy. It's Christ. That's the foundation for our decision-making. Now, Paul goes on in this passage in Colossians, and he touches on another process in Colossians 2. In him, 
You were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That's probably pretty good for blokes. By putting off the body of, of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, which we're going to do after the service because of the imagery it brings, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together in him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements or laws that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in the food or in drink or regarding a festival or of new moons or Sabbaths. Now it says Sabbaths in plural because they had their Sabbaths on Saturdays, but they had religious Sabbaths as well. And probably there was a religious Sabbath on the Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday before Easter, which is most likely when Jesus was crucified. So anyway, there's a religious Sabbath as well. Just a little one there for you. Okay, and which are a shadow. Listen, a shadow of things to come. But the substance is of Christ. In other words, he's saying everything that we looked at in the Old Testament is a shadow. It's not wrong, it's a shadow. A shadow gives you some idea of the thing that the shadow is made from. But depending where the light is, it may distort the shadow. But when we come to the real, the real is going to be Christ. And so he goes on and says, these are shadows, but Christ is the substance. Let no one cheat you out of your reward, taking delight in false humility and the worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, and if you read Paul's other passages, the people of God are the body and Christ is the head, not holding far to, fast to Christ, from whom the whole body is nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments and grows with the increase that comes from God. Therefore, if you died in Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as living in the world do you subject yourself to those regulations? Don't touch this, don't taste that, don't handle this which all concern things which perish with the using, listen, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility and neglected the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. See, religion is human reasoning applied to the teachings of God. And if you don't keep the rules that men make, then you're not right with God in their mindset. But Paul says these things are pointless. They don't help in changing the heart of a man. You know what happens? If, if the heart is wrong and you have a whole bunch of rules, people find a way to get around the rule. For example, the Pharisees, they, they had an Old Testament rule that says on a Sabbath day, you couldn't journey more than a certain distance from your dwelling. So you were meant to take a day of rest with God. You're meant to use that time in your home to grow, to know God better. If you're family, you know your family better. What the Pharisees did, they would get a servant who would go one Sabbath day's journey that distance and set up a little tent, a booth. And the Pharisees would walk to the booth. He would sit down, maybe have a drink, and then the servant would take the booth down and go another day's journey. And the Pharisee would walk another day's journey. And so on any Sabbath, he could walk as far as he liked by having a servant go one Sabbath day's journey. So he never went more than one, but he did one and one and one and one and one and one and one because he found a way around the rule because his heart wasn't right with God. See, religious rules are easy to get around. When I was young, I went to a church that had a whole bunch of rules. But after every service, people would get aside in their little groups and all criticize one another. But they would hold to their rules. We're all of God because we did this one thing. They forgot there were actually 10 commandments, not the one they held. And it's what I said to someone I knew really well. 
They said, you keep one rule, but you go outside and you hate each other. And Jesus said, by the love we have one for another, the world will know we're Christians. Not by the rules we keep, by how much we reflect Christ to our world. Not what's natural human reasoning. Human reasoning says, get even. God says, forgive. If you want to be free, forgive. Take the burden off yourself of trying to get it. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will look after that issue. Trust me with it. But God, they hurt me. They hung me on a cross. Let's do a comparison test. They tortured me. My best friends abandoned me. I get rejected by my own people. Let's do a comparison. I left eternity where it was perfect and lived among you where it was sinful. And then I gave my life and arose again. And I'm still praying for you that the Father and you would be connected again in hope, in love. And I'm still pouring my love out upon you. Let's compare the offense against us to the offense against him. Religious rules have got no value. See, the cross is the core value. Jesus, who is God. 1 John 2, 2 in the CEB says this, he, Jesus, is God's way of dealing with our sins and not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. NIV Reader's Version says it this way, he gave his life to pay for our sins. He didn't only pay for ours, he also paid for the sins of the whole world. So if Jesus has paid every debt we have ever had or will ever have, and we are debt free before God, what law stands against us? Come on, if you go to a court and you've paid all your traffic fines and speeding tickets and using your mobile phone while driving fines, and you go before a judge and he goes, it's all paid, what are you doing here? You're free, you're free. No law stands against us because Christ has paid for all our sins and all the sins of the whole world. No law is going to get people to heaven or get people out of heaven. The conclusion simply biblically is this. Do you know him? Do you know him intimately? Have you got a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? It's not about the laws. It's not about religion. Nothing legal is against us, church, and nothing legal is against people who don't come to church. Just stop and think about that. When we see people who are outside of the faith in Jesus Christ, do we see them as worse than us? Do we see them as people who are in debt to sin? They may be, but they're certainly not in debt to God. Their sin debt's been paid by the blood of Jesus. What they need is to know Jesus. They don't need to know religious rules and regulations. They don't need us looking down on them and condemning them. They need us loving them like Christ loves us and them. They need us to express the heartbeat of God. See, it's not philosophy and it's not religious rules. It's Christ who is the key to it all. Remember Matthew 7, he said, Depart from me, I never knew you. We were not in a living, vibrant, increasingly growing relationship. Very quiet here in this Lutheran church. Thought you might be cheering. (laughs) He's saying to them, you didn't bother to get to know me. You did all these things in my name, but you actually never got to know me. I gave you power. The power was so that you might know me. Not only so you could do things, it was so you might become a child of God in more fullness. That you might know your relationship as children of God, as brothers and sisters. The power wasn't primarily to do that. It was that you would be in relationship with him. And the power was that you might draw others into relationship with him. But you can, you can set people free with power. But that's no good having people set free if you don't set them free to something. Free to know Jesus. And they'll follow us. In that passage in Matthew 7, it was basically Jesus said, You rejected the invitation. You rejected an invitation to intimate relationship with God. Rejected it. And God has great sorrow. 
But because he loves us, he allows us to choose a life with him or a life without him. In Matthew 22, Jesus tells the parable of a wedding and the people are invited and they reject the invitation. Listen, it wasn't, it wasn't the invitee that rejected them. It was the invited that rejected the offer. Guess who didn't come to the wedding? Those who were invited and rejected the invitation. See, it won't be God who determines people's eternity. It will be each and every one of us because God has already made the way open. Like musicians sing us to come. God has already made the way open for everyone to come, to know him, to have a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, to know Jesus and to walk with him. And the question is, will we accept the invitation to join with Jesus or will we reject that invitation? There is one person that does come and he's accepted the invitation, but he hasn't developed it. He just turned up. No change. No transformation. The Bible says, put off the old and put on the new. It's about a response to the accepting of this message that God loves you. See, the cross made a way. The Bible finishes very much in the end in Revelation 22, and it says this, and the spirit and the bride say come and let him who hears say come and let him who thirsts come whoever desires let him take the water of life freely and sadly it goes on to describe a book called the land's book of life the guest book of those who said yes in fact when I read it, my understanding is the book is full of everyone's name. But when people reject him, he has no option but to cross the name out. To cross the name out. To cross the name out. And we have this life to accept the invitation. And I'm asking you today, like I said right at the beginning, you're not here by accident. God wanted you to hear that He's made the way open for you in Christ. It's not something you can reason with your mind. It's not something religion gets right. It's faith in Christ. But will your name stay written or will it be blotted out? See, you choose. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. So I'm asking you, will you choose Jesus today? Or will you reject the invitation for life, love, eternity? Can we bow our heads in prayer? Father, in this place today, just before we have a baptismal service, maybe there are people here today who've heard the call. They hear the Spirit of God speaking to them in, in their heart and spirit. And you're saying now, don't put it off anymore. You're calling them to this place. And it's not an accident that they're here. And I'm asking you today, what will you do? Will you accept or reject Jesus? So in this attitude of prayer with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you would say, I, I, I'm going to accept the invitation today. I accept Jesus. Would you raise your hand where you are? Come on, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. Any others here today? Come on, any in the balcony up there, I see that hand, I see that hand, the two up there, you can put it down now. Any more up there? A whole bunch of people have raised their hand already today. Maybe, maybe you're struggling, you know, what's he gonna ask of me? Well, Jesus hung on a cross, what he did for us. Would you accept him? I love, please, another call. Anyone else who hasn't raised their hand yet you want to say yes to Jesus today? Okay. I'd love us all to stand. 
For those of you who raised your hand, I, I want to ask you another, another thing. I want to ask of you a choice. You, you raised your hand to say yes to Jesus. We're the family of God. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and for two things. One, for you, making a public decision helps you commit to it. Secondly, helping, uh, making a public decision helps us know that we need to help you on your journey, that you're a brother or sister in Christ because of your choice today. I'm going to ask, would you be willing to come and just stand at the front here with me just for a short time? I want to pray with you and have you pray with me. Just leave your seat right now. Come on. On the balcony and the ground floor. I'd love you. Come on out. I'm down here now. Come stand with me. Don't, if recommitment or first time does not matter, please come. I know it's caked courage. When the first one does it, others will get more courage. Maybe be the one who encourages others to come. Come on. I saw your hands. I'm not going to point you out or try and embarrass you. I saw your hands. Hallelujah. He hung publicly on a cross. The world mocked him, scoffed him. Lord, I pray right now for those who did raise their hands. Lord, you fill their hearts and lives with a fresh courage, the fresh power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, they raise their hands in acknowledgement. And so right where you are, in fact, we'll get the whole church. I'd love you to pray with me audibly, wherever you might be. I, I know it, you know, public speaking scares people courageous, gets rid of their courage. So I'm gonna ask you to pray with me. I ask the church family to pray. I want you to pray loud enough for you to hear it in your own ears. So would you all join me now as we pray? Let's go. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for what Christ has done for me. Forgive me. Receive me as your child. I accept Jesus Christ as Lord of my life today. Amen. I'm going to pray for you, Father, for those people. Lord, I help, pray that you would help them connect with others. Help them have the courage to share with others. Lord, that they might find this is a safe place. For we are part of your family. We are brothers and sisters and we're learning with all our ups and downs to love one another in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to have a water baptism now. Um, they're going to sing. You can stay standing or seated, whatever. If you're getting baptized today, uh, you want to get changed in the toilet area and then come and wait over the front here, just down here at the front section. Um, just come join us and uh, the rest of you just hang around and who knows what God will do in this meeting. Wonderful. Baptismals. I think it's fabulous. So uh, today we're going to start with uh, family first. So I'm going to start with Cruz. It's Cruz and Troy. Where's Dad? Come on up. You guys come on in. This is Cruz. What a fine young man. Part of the youth for a while now. Uh, I just believe God has his hand upon this, this young man's life and there's a destiny ahead of him. And uh, baptism is where we choose to follow Jesus. It's where our faith has a, another public expression of a commitment to Jesus Christ. And, and, and while we're doing this, maybe you were one of those people who raised your hand at the, at the service. If you ever, when you see this, you might sense the presence of God. And you say, you know, I want to get baptised. Well, I've got, we've got a couple of spare towels there. You might have to go home wet. Um, but when we finish the, the ones that are already asked, um, I would love to see if you want to consider. Now, if you're young and your parents aren't here, the answer is no. <laughs> you just have to wait. If your parents are here and they're happy, you've got to be probably 9, 10, 11, 12, something like that. Um, but Cruz, come over here, mate. You love God, don't you? Yes. You do. What a fine young man. Yeah, mum and dad are proud of you, I'm sure. Hey, Troy, yeah. he's a good young man. You're going to follow Jesus, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Hold your arms, 
Father, this young man, Cruz, wants to follow you. Lord, he's been walking in the way. He's learning and growing in his faith. Lord, I pray that there would come upon his life a very increasing conscious awareness of the presence of God around his life. Lord, even in the night seasons, that's like Samuel, he would hear the voice of God upon his life. Even the courage and the wisdom to say, here I am, Lord, speak. And he'd hear your voice to his heart and the plan of destiny that you have for him would come to pass. I speak life and health upon his name. And in the name of Jesus and the confession of your faith in Jesus Christ, we baptize you into the Father, Son, Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Jamison, start with. So this is Jamison and Ramea, their brother and sister getting baptised today. Dad's helping me again. I love, I love having dads involved if they can be. It's just, especially if they love God, there's something of the destiny of God. Uh, and one of the great joys I have is actually baptising kids whose parents in the faith, and especially you know baptising kids whose of the parents I dedicated or baptised as well. God is into family, generation upon generation. One of the things I love about this church, and you see the faith of mum and dad, and, and, and it's not a fake faith. You know, ups and downs and challenges. I know them well enough to know they don't pretend that everything goes really good. You know, it might go okay fishing, but... <laughs> Big fish today. Big fish. This is a bigger fish than you ever want. It's what Jesus told Peter, I'll make you fishes of men. Fishes of men. You love God, don't you, mate? Yeah. yeah you're going to follow him all the days of your life? Yeah. You yeah, fold your arms. Jamison, the confession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We baptize you into Jesus Christ in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name. Happy day. Happy day. Oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same. Hi, Ma. Hello. You get some good friends out there. <laughs> some good, I, I love it. I see you hanging around with the girls, and, and I just think, that I see the excitement and the joy you guys have, and just in, encouraging one another, doing girl stuff. But I just think that, to me, seeing that family and that love for one another, I am so proud of you guys, all of you. I really am. You know, I'm getting the old codger in the house now, and I love seeing young people loving God with a passion. Is that good? More mature people. Isn't it great to see young people loving God? Yeah. <laughs> they might do it different to us, and it would have been wrong for our generation, but it's right for their generation. It's a different language, a different world. I mean, you love God, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. You're going to follow him all the days of your life? Yeah. I apologize for that. And may I, in the confession of your faith in Jesus Christ, before I go, I believe there's something of God and the destiny of God upon your life right now. I believe there's a joy that's going to flow out of you that's going to encourage many others to want to follow Christ that your life would be a light in many dark places and many, many backslidden will come back because of your joy and the joy of the Lord in your life. And so because of the confession of your faith in Jesus Christ, we baptise you into Jesus Christ in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Oh, happy day, happy I Come on, Pastor Robert. Kobe, come on in, mate. This is Kobe. He's a champion young man. I love, love what God's doing in his life. He and Tanika. Where is Tanika? Down the front here somewhere? Oh, just here. I look at this couple. I see the beam on their faces and what God's doing. Faith can move mountains, right? Can. can move mountains. It really is amazing. He's been helping us out in Childers as well, and, 
and, and just uh, a real sense of God upon your life, mate, a real drawing of God. Yeah. Not always easy to follow in the ways of God. It's like, wow, I'm learning so many things. God calls us. Put on Christ. You're going to follow him all the days of your life? Amen. 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 Hold your arms. Well, I sense a real desire to learn and to grow. And I pray there would come a, a, a revelation of intimacy with you upon Kobe's life. Let him know that you have a plan for him that's amazing. Lord, a destiny that will bring great joy even in the middle of challenging seasons. I pray that he would be conscious of that. Lord, there would be such an awareness in his life of your love and your strength. And so, Kobe, on the confession of your faith that Jesus Christ is your Lord, we baptize you into Jesus Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Where's Joseph? Come on in, Joseph. I believe you've got some friends and family here to see you get baptized. Oh, you are coming in. Come on in, Dad. You just wait here. I'm so glad Dad's coming, right? Yeah. Really. We had a bit of a chat before. And did. You did. I thought I was, I was going to let him come on his own, but. Yeah, it's a very proud moment. So. Yeah, it is a very. Where's mum? Is she here ready the camera? Yes. Yeah, Excellent. She, oh, there she is. She's right there. She's allowed to come and get close, get a photo. Mate, you love Jesus, don't you? Yeah. A whole bunch of young people around there. Okay, where's his friends? You got a couple. A whole bunch of them, mate. Oh, go on down here too. Yeah, I, I'm excited, mate. You excited? Yeah, very. Yeah. You know, this, is, this is how you know, Jesus' disciples actually baptized people. The Bible actually says it's a way people were added to the, the body, the local church, local family. They were added to Christ when they made a decision to believe. But this is how they're added to the local church. And so if you're a believer in Christ being baptized, this young man, like the others, he, he's saying, hey, I, I want to be a part of this family. This season in his life is part of this family. We have a responsibility to help all these people grow in their faith. They need to see in us the love of God, the patience, the forgiveness, the forbearance and in the challenges of life. You see that amongst the young people? A bit of stir is half of them, eh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You going to follow him all the days of your life? Yeah. Good on you, mate. You love Jesus. Fold your arms. Joseph, on the confession of your faith in Jesus Christ, we baptize you into Jesus Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Where's Bree? Come on in. Amazing mum. Okay, Bree, how are you? Where are the kids? Are you here somewhere? Uh, he's around there somewhere. There. No hey, how are you, right? Hey, <laughs> do you want, you want to come closer? No? Okay, <laughs> you're right. You know, for him to see you doing this, what a great example. You know, Paul tells Timothy, I see the faith of your grandmother and your mother in you. You're going to impart into his life today by doing this. You're setting something in his heart that will prepare him for eternity. How exciting is that? We are so proud of you, Brad. We really are. You're going to follow Jesus all the days of your life? Yeah, fold your arms. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for family. We thank you that we can be an extended family to mums and their children. And they would grow and know the love of God. They'd know the, the companionship of friends, people who stand with them. In the midst of all that, know that you are with them. You will never leave them or forsake them. And Bree, on the confession of your faith in Jesus Christ, we baptize you into Jesus Christ in the name of the Father, 
Son, and Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Oh, happy day, happy day. You are crossing away. Oh, happy yeah. day. Happy, happy day. day. Come on. I'll never be the same. Oh, happy day, happy, happy day. day. You wash my sin away. Oh, oh happy day. I'll never be the same. So is anyone who came up wants to get baptized? No. Let me pray. Father, I just thank you today for people who followed you through the waters of baptism. Lord, for people who've raised their hands and made, made a decision to follow you. I pray you'd give us all courage to walk in your ways. Those the early church was called followers of the way of Christ. We would also, in our Christian life, be followers of the way of Christ, examples of love, joy, peace, hope in our world. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Good morning, church. Go in the grace of God. Have some fellowship outside for tea and coffee. Look at each other face to face. God bless you.